You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name is Richard Moore, and this is the November episode of the cycling podcast Femina in association with Rafa. Orla Shinawi is taking a break this month, so we're going to hear a conversation recorded at the Rafa Clubhouse in Manchester earlier this season with the Canyon Shram riders Hannah Barnes and Mika Kroger. It's a wide-ranging chat covering everything from Barnes' return from injury and her experiences with British cycling to Kroger's unconventional winter training expeditions. Towards the end of the conversation, we also hear from their director sportif, Beth Jurea. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming along to the Rafa uh, Cycle Club in Manchester. We'll chat for a bit um, and then ask for a few questions. I'm joined by two members from Canyon Shram, Hannah Barnes there on, on the far left, far right as you're looking. Or I was at Flesh for One last week and she was introduced as Anna Barnes. <laughs> she might prefer, I like that. Uh, and beside her, Mika Krog- Kroger. She was giving me lessons in this earlier. Was that okay? It was all right. Thank you. <laughs> so we're, we're two national champions. Hannah, obviously, a uh, British road race champion. We've also got the silver medalist from the British road race championship in the room, at the back of the room there, Alice, her sister, who uh, probably hates being pointed out like that. But uh, I'm sure she's got her eyes on that jersey this year. But we'll maybe get onto that a bit later on. I'll just run through some of their achievements. They both are 23. Uh, Hannah started racing at 10, was part of the British cycling talent team for a while. She was under 14 national omnium champion, multi-junior national champion. 2015, she won stage five of the women's tour. 2016, she was a British road race champion, narrowly ahead of her younger sister. And she also was a member of the Kanye Shram team that won a silver medal in the world team time trial championship. Mika... In 2011, she was third in the World Junior Time Trial Championship. 2012, second in the European Under-23 Time Trial Championship. And she was German Pursuit Champion. 2013, German Omnium Champion. It's a long list, this. 2014 and 2015, European Under-23 Time Trial Champion. We're about halfway through it now. 2015, German Time Trial Champion. 2015, Gold medalist in the Team Time Trial Championship with Kanye Stram. 2016 second, like with Hannah, in the, in the Team Time Trial. And first in the German Road Race Championship. She's very modest. I only met Mika tonight, but she, she might... She described the German Road Race Championship as quite an underwhelming, sort of boring race. Then I had it described to me by Beth Durea, who helps run Kanye Stram. And it sounded an absolute thriller. So I think everything she says, we can sort of exaggerate it, embellish it a little bit. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to start with both of you. I mean, Hannah, you, you began racing at 10. It's a very young age to begin racing. Uh, how, how did you get into it? How did it start? Um, so every weekend was mainly revolved around bike riding. Um, my, my dad really loved it. It was one of his hobbies, and he kind of wanted us to just kind of enjoy the same hobby as him. Um, and then when we were 10... He took us to Team Keen, which is in Milton Keynes, and we were doing their Wednesday youth races there. And then um, he took us up to one of the national events in S- Sunderland. Sorry, went quite a long way for that. And then um, from there, we just did every every race. Most weekends was going to a bike race. Had you done other sports, or was was it your first real serious sport? Um, at school, I was always the sporty one. I did everything that I could. When I was 16, I got into the county hockey, hockey squad, and my dad was, he said, this is where you've got to try and make your decision now. So I, I went for cycling. And what did you enjoy about it? Um, I was good at it. <laughs> And I just, I don't know, it was kind of the, the freedom that it gave you when you could go training. And I think back with them, when you're 15 and 16, you have so many friends in the peloton. Um, so, yeah, I would just, just loved going to all the races. I was going to, I mean, I was going to ask, were there many, I can't imagine there were too many 10-year-old girls racing bikes. So, how, you know, how did you, who did you race with? And, and were there any, as you grew up, were there many other girls to ride with? Uh, so I was racing with Lucy Garner, um, Amy Roberts, Eleanor Barker, Laura Trott, 
So all those names that are still going now. And that was kind of the group. And as you went up, I mean, the when I was that young, the girls would always race down a category. Yeah, so it was fair. So I was racing John Dibbon uh, and uh, Hugh Carthy as well. So that was pretty cool. I actually remember beating John Dibbon. It was the best. I crossed the line and I think every single parent yelled, yes, like someone's beaten him. Uh, so I was about, I think, 13 when that happened. And now John Dibbon, of course, rides for Team Sky yeah. and has magnificent hair. Um, which might, might have been, a, I don't know if he had mag- magnificent hair back then, but mm. might have slowed him up. Uh, Mika, how about you? How did you, I think you were, you started a little bit later, didn't you? Yeah, I started when I was 15, maybe, 15 and a half years old. Yeah, I just, um, well, we've always been riding a bike a lot in our family, to school, everywhere. We did uh, cycling holidays, but yeah, just like that. <laughs> and um, what, at one point, I just had the idea that I, I could maybe have a race bike, so... I said to my mom, oh, mom, I want to have a race bike. And then she said, oh, well, Mika, but that's quite expensive. Don't you want to try it first? <clears throat> so I I wrote a mail to my former primary school teacher, who I knew was on my, which is now my yeah, kind of home club. <laughs> and um, then I did a test ride. And I had to like it because I wanted to have a race bike. So... <laughs> Um, that's how it all started. So your your former primary school teacher was uh, a cyclist or involved in the sport. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so did he become a coach or mentor? Yeah, for the first maybe two years, he was kind of the my my coach. Yeah, but I just I just went to the to the trainings, and yeah, at one point they um, they asked me if I want to try racing. I never had that in mind. Racing, really? I don't know. Um, and so I said yes. <laughs> and that's how the story begins. <laughs> and so what kind of scene is there in, in Germany? I mean, what, again, as with Hannah, did you, were there other girls for you to race with, to train with, or did you have to travel to, to do that? Well, for training, I only had the boys of my home club. I don't know, we were maybe a group of five to seven young cyclists. And for the races, it was always a small group which raced together in my area. So maybe seven, eight, nine girls. So not a huge peloton. At what stage did you realize that you were good at it and, and, and you know, set your sights on becoming a professional, making it a career? The first time I realized I was good at it well, maybe the first time I got invited by my, by my, who's now my coach, to a lab test, and where well, I just wrote until I couldn't anymore, and that was I think that was quite good. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See what I mean? I told you. I warned you. <laughs> oh, sorry. You did very well in your lab test. Uh, yeah. 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 I think so. And. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, then it all developed. I got into the national team. And <laughs> I got an invitation for the Junior World Championships. And on the bottom, it was written, if you can't take part in this, um, in this race, contact the, um, the national coach immediately. And I thought, oh, mm, I want to go to holiday with my friends. Should I now call him? Like, I, actually, I don't have a choice if you get invited to Junior Worlds, you go there. But yeah. I was not really into the scene, so I thought I could just say no, but fortunately I did it. You didn't. And, and you, I mean, you've spent a lot of time on the track as well, haven't you, over the years? What, over here in Britain, the track program is, is big, and we'll speak to Hannah about that in a moment, but what's it like in Germany? Was the track something that, you know, offered possibilities for you in terms of, you know, maybe going to the Olympics and things like that? Yeah, I mean, if you... If you're in, if you're good in Germany as a junior, you do track and road. You do both. So they just set me on a track bike and said, "Go." That's what I did. And then I, yeah, I did the junior world championships 
in my second year junior in 2011 in Moscow. And um, they wouldn't let me ride the, you know, like points race, scratch race. They would only let me do the pursuit because, yeah, I'm not used to track racing. I wasn't used to track racing. And, yeah, then I just stayed on the team and I did the World Cup in Colombia in 2011 as a junior. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, from then on I was on the track program for the Olympics, yeah. But you're 100% roads now. Yes, now, uh, since Rio, I'm, I I quit the track racing and I'm 100% road racer now. But we'll also we'll get on to some of the, the stuff that you do besides just training and racing because you, you, you've got quite an unusual way of preparing for the season. Uh, Hannah, going back to when you started, to, well, you started to have success very, very early and you became part of the British cycling talent team. And, you know, that already was a sort of, a factory, if you like, for producing, you know, champions. What was it like to become? Well, how did how did how were you picked up by them, and, and what was it like to become part of that? Um. So when I was thirteen, um, Jenny Gretton, who was I guess would go to the races and scout the juniors and the youths, um, invited me onto a selection camp. So I came up to Manchester, and yeah, I was there was three coaches, and I think there was fifteen riders, and yeah, we went there. We rode as fast as we could, as hard as we could, and then from there they picked uh, picked the next group of talent team riders, and I, I made that. I was mainly a mountain biker, I did a lot of mountain biking at the start, but then when I joined the talent team, you that's where I had to decide if it was track and road or mountain biking, and I decided to do track. So, yeah, my first track session was a Madison session, and I was Dan McClay's partner, <laughs> so that was pretty scary. But f yeah, from there I would, yeah, I'd be in Manchester every every other week pretty, pretty much just for two days. And as I said, that, you know, that is a pathway. We've seen so many um, riders, male and female, come through that, become part of the Team Pursuit team. Mm -hmm. Was that something that you seriously considered at that time or were you attracted to, to you know, to keep it varied and to, to keep riding the road as well? Yeah, I mean, I did and I've never done a a major championship on the track. They would always put me in for the road if I was junior, under 23 or anything. Um, and for me, I just, just the freedom and adventure that road racing gives you is something that I love. And for me, I just, the thought of having to go to one velodrome every day and just ride around in circles, it just didn't, didn't excite me as much as road racing. Um, so yeah, I made the decision and yeah. I don't regret it, but I, I do. I have started to miss it quite a bit. Yeah, we'll get we'll get on to that. I mean, you were we were talking earlier just about you, you were. I don't know when it it happened that you said you got in trouble uh, on one occasion for leaving for being on your phone in the track centre. I was going to ask about um, what we, we've. There have been loads of headlines and stories about the culture at British Cycling. You were you were part of it. How how did you find it? I mean, is it the 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 picture that we're we're given now certainly from some people. Is that one that you recognize? Is it, is it accurate as far as you're concerned? Um, not really. I mean, cycling is it's a professional sport. You're in an industry where you have to hit targets and goals and get medals. And there's a reason why Great Britain have so many successful Olympians and world champions. and Because there's a whole behind the scenes of people working so hard to 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 help all those riders um and for me i've i've had so much help i mean i suffered a bro a broken ankle and the day after i broke that ankle i had richard freeman on the phone saying giving me advice i was in america so he he didn't really have any information on it really i was just telling him what i thought and as soon as i got to england he gave me a ct scan and every single ct scan after that was organized by him He'd ring me up, he'd, I'd burst into tears and he'd be the one that was there on the other end just making me feel better. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, if it wasn't for them, I don't know how I would have got through those those months. Because, of course, as well as being a member of Kanye Shram, you're still yeah. part of the wider British British squad, aren't you? And you ride world championships and, and so on for them. Shane Sutton is somebody that you, that you know well and he, you, you were saying that he... He tipped you to be the next Nicole Cook on one one training ride. When was that? Um, that was 2010, I think. 
But I mean, Shane, he uh, he runs tight ship, but that you have to in this environment. It's such a hard environment to be in. It's it's mentally really tough and physically as well. And you need someone there that just going to push you that extra little bit that you need. And he was really great at doing that. And I think, yeah, a lot of people, I mean, for me, I was at the Commonwealth Games and he was riding next to me and he's just, he was just talking to me like I was just a normal person and just what have I been up to and where do I see my, what my ambitions and things. So he, just, he was just there when you needed him and to give you that extra push. But, you know, you, you went your own path and it, it, it's a path that riders through the years have, have, have taken. You, you mentioned the, the adventure that the road offered. I mean, you went off at a young age to Holland initially, didn't you? He's smiling at that. Uh, just talk us through how those next few years uh, unfolded. You know, went Holland and then the US until you came back and joined Canyon Shram. So yeah, when you're a junior, uh, you just think that the only thing that you have to do to make it in as a professional is go to Europe. That's just what everyone thinks. Um, so I did that. I lived in Holland when I was 19, so in 2012. And I was very, very close to not riding my bike anymore. I found it so hard. You'd go to races and I think it took me seven races to finally finish one. And it's, it's really, really, really tough. Um, so I came back to England and rode for MG Maxifuel and did all the tour series and the Nocturnes and just all the, the races in, the, in England and Britain. And actually it's thanks to the Smithfield Nocturne and Mark Cavendish that I got onto UHC. Um, he tweeted about it and the, di the manager of the team saw it and researched it and yeah, got in contact with me. And at the start, it was a bit overwhelming to move to America, but I had a really great two years there. That, I didn't actually know that. So that, that, that was that the 2013 Nocturne yeah. when you were famously disqualified <laughs> for celebrating yeah. initially? You were, you were, so it was you and Laura Trott you put your arms in the air, celebrate victory, and you were demoted for that. Yeah. That must have been odd. <laughs> it was. I got, yeah, for dangerous riding was why I was disqualified. <laughs> Which, yeah, I mean, it was Laura, and for me to beat Laura, I was pretty excited, so I celebrated a little bit too early before the line. Um, but we were just going past lapped riders, so I could see how it was dangerous, but I would say that's the organizer's fault for making that situation dangerous so yeah everything went a bit crazy those next couple of days and then i think it was the wednesday they um they overturned it and i won justice prevailed in the end <laughs> <laughs> yeah cheer a cheer there the cycling podcast femina is supported by science in sport science in sport fueled by science Thank you to Science and Sport for sponsoring the cycling podcast Femina. And a reminder that listeners can get 20% off their Science and Sport products by entering the code CPAUG20 at the checkout at scienceandsport.com. Mika, um, Hannah was talking there about the, the adventure and the enjoyment of riding your bike. I mean, you know, racing is what you do, but tell us about your quite unconventional preparation for for the season i think this started a couple of years ago yeah um in 2014 due to the uh track preparations and track um winter i always had my break afterwards which was in february or march so i had to do my i had to start training again and yeah get get some miles into my legs and so i thought I thought about what to do and I didn't want to go to Mallorca or just, you know, write, write the laps at home. <laughs> um, so I packed my bag and um, started off from my hometown to the north of Germany with uh, panniers, which were way too heavy. So <laughs> um, after my first stage, I bunked completely. It was wet, it was cold, it was actually, it was a really, it was one of the worst, worst weathers of the year. And my mom was like, do you really want to start now? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I sent a package back, maybe four kilos. So I went on with a, with a bit less 
I, it was completely un uh, unprepared. I had a jeans with me, I had a normal pullover with me, I had a normal towel with me because I was sleeping in youth hostels where you don't get towels. And then <laughs> I... <laughs> how, how, long, how long was this first trip? Uh, I think I was away for 14 days and I rode 12 days of it. How, yeah. So what kind of distances were you covering? Mm, from 93 the first day to 157 the fourth day kilometers obviously yeah, yeah. kilometers sorry yeah. And, and and i was asking about this cuz you know it's it's too every you're touring but you were you were training so you were you were actually riding hard yes <laughs> <laughs> was there any structure to it or or were you just riding hard were you well, just well i i orientated on on the normal you know when you do long rides uh you always do like which i was used to um from the from the national team training camp you build it like uh, the first day you do 90 110 130 then you do a rest day and then you start at 120 140 years. just like that and that's how i did it too just yeah and then and, and i mean it's so refreshing to hear you know a professional rider doing something like this i think and you've obviously incorporated into your your build up to the season, and it's working for you. So that was twenty fourteen was the first you did it, and you've done it the every year since then, have you? Or um, well, I didn't do it this year because um, this year was the first year I had a normal road winter. Mm. So yeah. <laughs> but but where tell us where you've been the last couple of years then, because you you've started to venture further afield. Yeah. Well, first it was just Germany. I rode north to. Um, yeah, Hamburg, uh, and then south east to Dresden. Um, I I finished in in Dresden or at the at the border to the Czech Republic, and then I got back by train. Uh, the second year, I started in Oppenheim, which is uh, like one hour from Bonn. Uh, I went south to Freiburg in Germany. Then I crossed the river, and then I was in France. Um, and then I rode a few days in France, but I became sick, so I had to take the train train back home. Do you, um, and when you set out, or do you know where you're going? Are you have you planned your route and where you're going to stay? Yeah, well, the first time I planned uh, only three days in advance. Um, the last two years I planned the whole tour, but the next time I would again plan only three days in advance. At once, it's a bit more of it of an adventure, <laughs> and and you obviously enjoy it. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Are you? You? I, I read that you you do plan to you know, well, I, I read that you want to go to Scotland, which I was very touched by that. That you, <laughs> well, <laughs> I think that's a great idea. When yeah. are you gonna When are you gonna go to Scotland <laughs> with your panniers? And I, do, I, I, I should, I mean, check out the youth hostels properly before you. <laughs> Before you set out, but it should be, it should be fun. Um, yeah, I, I think I would like the landscape, <laughs> from from what I've seen from uh, Great Britain until now, I, I enjoy the landscape, and I, I, yeah, I want to see it, yeah, and experience. R Rafa it. does some fantastic waterproof clothing as well, so <laughs> you'll you'll True. be you'll be fine. <laughs> Hannah, um, can you relate to that? The the do you? I mean. Can you still, we were talking earlier about how you've become a real slave to your power meter, um, but can you still can you still enjoy riding your bike? Yeah, I mean, the riding, uh, when you have a break, so I had a month off this, this, uh, this winter, and probably the next month after that is the time I enjoy the most, when you just completely switch off and you just do base miles. I think that's, yeah, it's just a, a really nice time to ride your bike. You were saying that you and your your boyfriend Teo were had planned a a similar sort of adventure through the Pyrenees. Was that a couple of years ago when you had your 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 terrible crash? Yeah, we um we had like a crazy plan that because where where we live is really close to the Pyrenees, um, so it's not that far to get there. So we were thinking of leaving Girona and then just heading into the mountains and doing a bit of a not a two week tour, but maybe a few days. But we never got to do that. And then uh, we actually went on holiday last year to Japan, and that would be the one of the best places to ride your bike, I think, and do that kind of holiday. So maybe in a few years' time, we'll do that. Tell us about 
living in Girona because, you know, it's a real hub for professional bike riders. There must be a huge community of you there. Is it, you know, the case that you, you can't walk around a corner without bumping into another professional bike rider? It, is it as, as packed with them as we imagine it is? And, and what's that like for, for training there? Yeah, so we moved there three years ago and there was... I think about six or seven pros that lived there. It was really small. Um, and then this year, it's, I think, as someone said 80, 80 professionals live there now from all over the world. So it has, yeah, if there was a part in November, I think there's a the cycling academy on their contract that every member of the staff and riders have to live in Girona. So there was one point in November where you had 35 people looking for the exact same apartment and it got a bit competitive <laughs> um but yeah you can be out to dinner and walk into a restaurant and there's yeah two two or three riders sat there having a meal too um which is great because if you want to go for a group ride with people it's there are so many people there to go with but sometimes you know and you get back from a race and you don't want to see cyclists or a bike and you see cyclists and a lot of our bikes. Um, <laughs> even Not even the professionals now, it's just there's a lot of touring companies there as well. Um, so you see a lot of amateurs. So we'll be walking around Girona and there's a group of eight or nine Brits deciding where to go for dinner, uh, which is kind of funny. But yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a massive cycling culture there now. Mm. You, you um, mentioned a couple of times the crash that you had in August, wasn't it, 2015, where you broke your ankle yeah. uh, very badly and you were on crutches for a long time I mean you were basically off the bike for five months was it yeah five months uh, so last year was really a kind of rebuilding process for you how 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 did that go obviously I think I think that obviously the national title was a, a great um success for you but I think the team time trial as well was a uh, something you were proud to play a part in um and, and did you f by the end of the season did you feel that you were back to your old fitness yeah I mean I had I think it was 18 weeks not with no leg, I couldn't put any weight on my leg. Um, and then 21 weeks, I was in a cast and crutches. So yeah, I um, had I had to just start from zero, which it was quite enjoyable in a way because you, you saw so much progress in such a short amount of time. Um, and for me, when I look back on it, I think that I'm kind of grateful it happened because I've I learned so much in those five months well the whole year really um like going through the injury and just I think I had six CT scans with neg <laughs> bad news every time so you just learn how to deal with things and it just gives you that bit of motivation that you need um but yeah I mean my target I had one target that the start of last year when I got on the bike and it was to make that TTT squad for the world championships and yeah I did that I when I found out I made the team I was so nervous because it was I mean this team how many had it won four golds I think they, they won it every year didn't they every since year. And yeah yeah so to make that team I was I mean I was learning from the best but I was yeah pretty petrified well Mika that brings us on to you because you you you're a bit of a team time trial specialist are you not you're gonna say no but uh, <laughs> you're you're a very strong time trialist and beth actually was was telling us about the 2015 race in particular in richmond in the u.s um where you're part of the, the gold medal winning squad there can you what do you remember about that that race well it was painful it was really really painful but it was um, more painful for everyone else <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, it was painful for everyone. But um, yeah, I mean, um, I think we managed it quite well. Um, the course was, um, had some rolling hills, uh, not, not rolling, they had, had some hills mm. and obviously also downhills. And um, we used me, um, as I'm quite tall and heavy, to motor it downhill. And um, yeah, so at the first checkpoint, we had 11 seconds of an advantage, so we had the best time. At the second checkpoint, it was a bit less. And then um, maybe, f I don't know, three, four, five K before the finish, 
we were behind Bull Stormans, who were then leading mm. by six seconds. And um, we were with five girls and four have to finish. And um, to the finish, it was a really steep um, uphill mm. and then a fourth slide to the finish. So before that, it was kind of a kind of a downhill. And so I motored it down the hill and at the bottom of the climb to the finish, um, we did not have any, well, we were leading by a small margin by then and we won it. You brought it home. <laughs> you, you turned you turned a disadvantage into an advantage. You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Well, listen, let's um, ask for some questions from the floor. If anybody, if you could speak into this machine, that would be helpful. Beth, would you mind coming up? Um, they say that cycling races are won on split-second decisions. If you go back to any race which might not have gone your way and changed that moment, which one would it be and, and what would you do differently? <laughs> What about the world? What about the world two race in Sweden last year, Hannah? When you went the, yeah. w- the wrong way around the traffic island? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I messed that up really, really bad. Yeah, we in Sweden there was a group of eight were away, I think, or something. And there was two hundred meters to go, and you go around a right-hand corner with a an island in the middle, and. I think it was just the first time I'd been in a winning situation in a really long time. And I just freaked and decided to go left around the island. Yeah, I don't know. Sorry about that, Hannah. I, 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 only, I only say that. No, I feel bad. True. I feel bad now. And but It was w- televised, so <laughs> yeah, everyone I, I can know see I watched it, it and everyone can replay it. And yeah. yeah. I watched, I watched it and I thought, what has she done that for? <laughs> well, I did it and thought, what have I done that for? Yeah. <laughs> I was willing you on. Yeah, it was strange. Any any races you'd like to replay, rewind and do again? Yeah, there's this one race, um, 2011 in Copenhagen. I was junior, um, junior World Championships. I was in a break with the Italian Rosa Larato. You were in that race? Yes, it was me. and i i don't know i so at some point it was maybe mm, three three k to go and i thought uh maybe you could attack now but i was um yeah i did not dare to attack so i i did not and i waited for the sprint sprint but it should never happen because we stopped working and we only had 30 seconds advantage and that's it. It was really bad. So, so what? Hang on. Um, <laughs> I think there's more to this story. But wh- why did why, why did you say that, Hannah? You were in that break. What What's your memory of this incident? I remember being, I think, three k from the finish, and just saying, "Oh, the race is won in that break." I honestly, I was like, "Oh, there's the race." <laughs> And we came around that the last, because in Copenhagen, you came around a right-hand turn, and I think it was probably 800 meters to the line, and it was up. And I saw you, I saw the break, and I was like, they must have just literally just stopped and had a cup of tea. (laughs) And yeah, we won, Lucy won, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have to say, um, we had the motorbike, which was, you know, showing us the plate with a mm. with our with our gap, and um, with three or two k to go, it said thirty five seconds. And I mean, I was I was completely inexperienced <laughs> in that situation. <laughs> and I look back, and I I actually I should have seen the peloton, but I did not. I only saw motorbikes. I just thought, okay, now we wait for the sprint. So. Yeah, but I did not know that the peloton was coming. Beth, are there any as a, as you know running the team? Have there been any races? <laughs> you maybe not want to say. Uh, <laughs> have there been any races you've watched unfold before your eyes, or, or watched back later, and just you know 
pinpointed a moment or a something that they could have done differently? Uh, there was two things. One I can remember was I think Holland Ladies tour last year. I was not director, but uh, there was a split in the peloton from uh, due to crosswinds. And the yellow jersey rider was in the second group and our team who was chasing the yellow jersey, we were in the first group, I think, with uh, three or four riders and we took too long to make the, and this isn't a race where there are no radios, we took too long to make the decision and to realise that the yellow jersey was in the second group and not to immediately go to the front of the first group and establish a time gap between the first and second group and therefore take over GC. So that's one I can remember from the outside. And then uh, there was a stage also I can remember as DS in uh, the Giro, women's Giro uh, two years ago where we had one rider in the break uh, and yeah, we miscalculated and in the end she potentially could have won from that break, but then it came back and yeah. Any other, any other questions out there? Are there any riders either current or, or past that you look up to as sort of role models in your peer group and I guess if you do why and what is it you've learned from them? Uh, for me joining this team I've joined Lisa Braneira and Trixie Warwick and for me they are the two people I look up to the most. Um, Trixie's been how long has she been a pro? 14 years? So I've learned so much from them and those the races I've done the last 18 months so yeah it's uh people ask me sometimes like what's so great about the team and everything and you just it's just the the people that are older than you that have more experience than you in the team they just teach you everything that they've learned and you can use that to develop and yeah progress especially Trixie she's been doing this for so long and she's really quiet but when she gets into a race She's just like a different person. She'll call all the right shots. And yeah, it's just uh, when you see the, the roster or the schedule and you're like, oh, Trixie's there. You, you know she's going to be the road captain and she'll, she'll just help everyone in that team So during the race. Is it, who, who's the rider who's not in your team who you most admire that, you know, that, that you've raced with? It's, it's hard because you, you're, you competitors they're like your competitors and you don't want to show them respect because you're racing them and Beth, Beth not nodding approvingly <laughs> that's a really good answer Hannah <laughs> well I, I, I was gonna ask Beth I'm gonna ask you a really unfair question if you could sign any right okay I'll say I'll say present or past you know if you could uh, no one will hear this so don't worry this will go to very few people uh, if you can sign any rider at all who would it be present or past present or past going to say so <laughs> no no definitely not um <clears throat> i think probably in a teutenberg or you did aren't uh, and i worked on teams where they were racing at the time but also i mean that's the the beauty of hindsight because you can look back and say okay they were really professional they were incredibly successful so of course, it's easy to, to choose those two riders to sign. But, I mean, Ina Teutenberg was someone who, I think she had more than 200 wins, was one of the most accomplished German female sprinter or female sprinters in the world. Uh, but also, when you when you worked with her, she, she had a real race personality, like a real sprinter, and just said it as it is. Uh, and after the race, if things didn't go her way, whether it was in, uh, within the team or teammates or within the peloton, she just said it, full with adrenaline. And then 30 minutes later or two hours later back at the hotel, she was just a normal person. Okay, let, okay let's go tomorrow and it's a new day. So someone who just said it as it is. Yeah. Mika, any, anyone you look up to? Actually, I... <clears throat> to be honest, I only got to know the peloton since I'm in this team. <laughs> um, so it's hard to say. I mean, I'm. I mean, for sure, 
I'm I have the same statue you say that uh, as Alan van Dyck so um yeah for sure that's that's someone I can compare myself mm. with yeah I mean, I've probably got time for one more question or two at a push, but if anybody's got a... There's a question over here. I'm just wondering, Mika, um, what is... Like, time trialling is really strong in, in Britain, um, and it happens every week, and anybody can race, and you just enter, and it's all over the country, and it's really good. What's it like in Germany? Not like that. <laughs> um... No, we don't have something like that. We have, yeah, national championships and maybe some, um, some yeah, small championships. But it's not for licensed riders, but for, um, yeah, I don't know, hobby cyclists. I don't know, amateurs. Yeah, exactly. So I, I could not race there. I w would not be allowed to. Yeah. No, just would say uh, from a team that has a lot of international riders then you really get to know the development system from each country and of course in Australia I know it well but in Australia Great Britain Italy and to a lesser extent oh sorry uh, Netherlands of course is right up there and to a lesser extent United States have a a really strong uh, development program for club racing, for amateur level racing, for Cat 4, Cat 3, uh, C grade, B grade, A grade, however it's classified depending on the country. Uh, and it's a distinct advantage and I think it's it shows when you look at the talent pool that then comes up. And Germany, uh, unfortunately at the moment, I would say they, they don't have a really strong... Uh, grassroots level of of club cycling for sure it's there absolutely uh, and the there's people you know who love cycling there they're fans of it when we race Turgen Rundfahrt in in Germany in July there's you know huge numbers of people there watching along the sidelines and supporting it and cheering it but it's a it's not compared it's not comparative compared to uh, uh, to Great Britain for example final question Um, it's clear that like cycling is your life that's your lifestyle but what do you do to switch off um cycling <laughs> 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 no um well go back home and meet my my school friends i like sewing so sewing, sewing. sorry <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we have a lot of things that Mika's made us. We had uh, at the Worlds, the TTT Worlds, Mika made us these little China pigs. All of us, was it Worlds? Yeah, so. in Qatar. Yeah. yeah, so it's quite nice. <laughs> For me, it's food, always food orientated. So we decide, oh, we'll, we find a restaurant however many K away and we drive there or scooter there or whatever. And I just bought a guitar. So I'm kind of learning to do that and, yeah, just things really that you just don't do much, I guess, when you don't ride a bike. You just recover and just take a step back. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Nobody would want to share a room with Hannah then if she's taking her guitar on the road. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing Spanish, actually, like in Liège. My th yeah, I was trying Spanish to guitar? Spanish. No, just Spanish. I've learning, well, living in Spain, I decided that I should probably start learning the, yeah. <laughs> the language. I've been doing lessons. But yeah. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much to both of you, Hannah and Mika, and thanks to Beth as well for joining us up here. Thank you. Thank you. You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa. Celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. This has been the November episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina and it was produced by Tom Wally. I'll be back with Orla Shinoui next month for a special look at some of the sponsors behind the top women's teams. In the meantime, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.